we're going to be talking about uh, the power of belonging. And it's especially challenging to talk about creating an inclusive environment in the church because the church can't, is a family, you know, and we can cultivate a sense of inclusion, but it's challenging to talk about it in that there are standards for church membership and for, you know, being part of the body of Christ, and you can't completely exclude those without jeopardizing the health of the body. There is a type of inclusion that is really compromised with the world, and we see biblical stories about that. The Israelites camped right on the edge of the promised land in Baal Peor and the Midianites all around them and oh well, let's make friends with our neighbors you know friendship evangelism well it ended up being the wrong kind of friendship evangelism because there was an outbreak of immorality in the camp that was dealt with very decisively through Phineas and that broke the spell and God's blessing could fall on Israel again. You remember that story. So there are some strong biblical stories and statements to the effect that we have to be very careful about the wrong kind of inclusion. But I don't think we can let fear of the wrong kind of inclusion keep us from appreciating and enjoying the right kind of inclusion. Does this make sense? So I've been through kind of a process with all of this, and I have come to love the Seventh-day Adventist Church as it is, with all of its warts and all of its flaws, but for many years was involved in ministries that really had kind of a separatist mentality. Um, I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist. I came into the church at 19, 18, 19 years old, right around that era of my life. And my friend Laura is here. She and I were baptized together. How many, it was so many years ago, like 45 years ago. Yeah, 46 years ago. In where were we? I know, but what was it? We remember we were in that church. Little, was it in Pullman? No, it was it was South Bend or something, or it was a different town? I think maybe I'm wrong. I don't think it was the Pullman church though. But I remember the pastor, Pastor Rose, right? Do you remember the pastor? I think it was the Sky Pastor Rose. Not the pastor, right. So anyway, she and I were baptized together with about five other women, young women, right, at an era of this, you know, self-supporting ministry's life that was just quite remarkable because a lot of people came in. Let me tell you the story briefly. I attended, after a lot of searching, I found this school in Grand Valley, uh, it was Grand Valley State College, and it was a subsidiary of that college called Thomas Jefferson. So there were a number of different colleges within this state university in just outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I had found that through a series of events where I was just kind of searching spiritually, and God led me step by step to this place where Laura was. So we were part of this Thomas Jefferson, which was an experimental program that was very different than your typical classic liberal arts education. So there was a dance department. I was really involved in the dance department. And there was a lot of really avant-garde, weird dance stuff that went on, a lot of really creative, crazy people. But there was, you know, regular other departments. What, what department were you in? What, what kind of studies were you doing? Psychology. Okay. A lot of the philosophy things were new age. Yeah. So it was very saturated with, like, progressivism, you know, far left progressivism before we saw it, you know, kind of blossom in our culture. It was there in pockets and we were part of that pocket. And I didn't know uh, Laura before I got there, but we got to know each other as non-believers. And both of us then were converted to Jesus in the middle of that school year through a series of events. And then we both ended up at a Seventh-day Adventist self-supporting institution about half an hour away from the college. So the way that I, and we both ended up there different ways. It was so weird. But um, the way I ended up there was I met them at a cooking class they gave at the college. And I was already a vegetarian. I told you guys I became a vegetarian because my grandmother died and I don't, believed in reincarnation. And I didn't want to eat my grandmother if she came back as a cow, although I thought she'd come back as a human being. I mean, this is how I thought in those days. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up being a vegetarian. Then I ended up at this school, 
And I went to a vegetarian cooking class and I met the Seventh-day Adventists. And it was right around the time that I myself was coming to know Jesus and learning about Christianity a little bit. And then I met Adventists and Adventists were vegetarian or at least plant-based and emphasized that type of eating and really into nature and simple living and they were Christian. So seeing the combination of those two things was very powerful for me and I ended up talking to these people and they told me they came from this community that was about half an hour away so I didn't have a car or anything. I would hitchhike over there on Sundays and they had free food and I was a college student so when you have free food and you're a college student it's a marriage. <laughs> so I ended up moving there and my parents thought I'd lost my mind. They were like, what? You were in college a minute ago and now you're at this weird Seventh-day Adventist, what's that? I don't even know what it is. Institution or organization where these people were like farming and canning and trying to live off the land. The women all wore long dresses. The men wore suspenders. We were really into following the writings of Ellen White in a very exacting way. There was no interpreting her writing, taking the principle of it and applying it to today's world. You couldn't do that. You had to follow it to the letter. And the more you followed it to the letter, the more spiritual you were. So as a result of that, the first year of being there, and, and Laura, you showed up at a certain point um, having... We were roommates. We were roommates, but how did you end up finding, even finding out about Oak Haven? Because was it through me? He, he kept you from being in a what? A car accident. Oh. Two um, separate from two weeks ago. Oh. And I heard an audible voice. Three times that day, and the last time was right before the accident. God oh. kept me from being in that accident. And then I started reading the Bible and praying, and somebody handed me a chapter from Desire of Ages by Ellen White called The Invitation. Uh -huh. And when I read that, it was published. Who gave at, you that? Um, Lucia Giltz, I think her name what, was. A student at... at Thomas yeah, Jefferson? Yeah. What, what was she doing with that? Well, she had been there. Oh. She became Adventist too there. Oh, and I didn't yeah, know her. So, uh, oh. And her daughter. So she gave me that pamphlet. When I read it, I saw the same spirit as in the Gospel of John. And I thought, whoever wrote this knows the Lord like, the, like John did. And I thought I would meet them at Oak Haven. Of course, I didn't. But I did meet the, you know, helped him, it helped me know the Lord better. So that's how I Incredible. It. I didn't even remember. I'm sure you've told me, but I didn't remember that. So how did you meet this Lucia person? She was just another student, and she handed it to me. She was interested in the health food store, too. That's oh. how she got interested. So, But you said she food. was a Seventh-day Adventist? She became one. She became one. Yeah, through. But she never lived at Oak Haven? She visited. She visited. She had okay. a bunch of kids, so it didn't work to move there. Okay. But, you know, actually, oh. it was like from, from one polar opposite to the other. I know. And there was a lot of great things there, but there was things there that kind of went to extremes. And so finding that balance has taken You mean Oak Haven? Yeah. 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 So anyway, it's very providential that I'm talking about this because Laura was part of this sector of my life, this segment of my life. And, and she was right there at this self-supporting institution. And she's right. There was a mixture of good and bad there, <laughs> but, but it was... It was um, pretty extreme, I think. And the emphasis on dressing and diet and all of that was pretty extreme. And you felt the, the problem was not the wearing dresses, because people can do that in good conscience. I have friends that feel they need to wear dresses all the time. And God bless them. I don't want to get involved in someone's personal decisions about what they feel convicted about. But the, the problem was there was a sense that by doing those things, you were generating merit. You were getting in with God. And then when you start believing that you're getting in with God based on your adherence to standards, then you start to see people who are not adhering to those standards as not as in with God as you are. Isn't this kind of human nature? Don't we see this in the New Testament where the harlots would hang out with Jesus and the tax collectors and the people that had been much more obedient to God were like, what are you doing? 
They don't get perks with you. They don't get an in with you. We're the ones that have been generating all this merit all these years. And so there was the same kind of battle going on, and I noticed it there, too, is that it was just a sense of, like, we are the people, we are the elect, because we check all of these boxes. Part of the way through the first year I was there, a very unfortunate event occurred involving a man who believed that it was appropriate, this is fanaticism, it's gonna shock you, but he believed that it was appropriate to physically discipline adults in an administrative capacity. So he physically disciplined an individual who ended up getting his body bruised by that and then got sick. My understanding of what happened is he got a regular cold or a flu, but they would never give antibiotics or drugs or medications, never go to the doctor. He ended up dying of secondary infection as a result of the weakened immune system from the beatings he received from this man who was fanatically of the mind that it was appropriate to beat adults. Like that's pretty, that's pretty ugly, I know, and pretty crazy, but that happened while I was there. That's how fanatical the place got. It was deeply traumatic. It was very traumatic. By the grace of God, though, I was able to separate, and so was Laura, the teachings of scripture that we were just learning for the first time in our lives from that horrific fanaticism that occurred and the extremes to which other people went. And Laura and I were able to learn those things and we were baptized and then we followed on to know the Lord and got a little more balanced in our lifestyle and approach. And Laura is still here after about 100 years and I'm so glad you're still here. <laughs> Every once in a while, I see her on Facebook, and I'm just like, she's still in the body of, she's still in the family of God in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I'm so proud of her for, because we were crazy guys. I mean, we were really crazy. So <laughs> I'm just being real. All right, so we're going to talk about the power of belonging and how important that is to our spiritual growth and our soul winning. You know, giving people a sense that they belong somewhere. And by the way, people don't have to be members to have that sense of belonging. I think we should have kind of two tiers of membership in the church. Some people are going to come along. They're not going to be ready for baptism. There's a lot of boxes you have to check, a lot of things you have to accept. Not everybody's ready for that, but should we not embrace them anyway as a member of our family so we can create a sense of social belonging, even for people that aren't maybe ready for the full membership of the church. So I want to talk to you about that and how we can cultivate that in our churches. And I want to say this, that at the beginning of COVID, I've been running this Abide Network mental health coaching ministry for about 12 years. And I, I've developed it. It's been developing all along that period of time. But at the beginning of COVID, it sort of went on steroids because now everything you did was online. We were always online doing coaching but now everything was online and the ministry exploded. We started a Friday night Bible study we're doing to this day. It's like a church. We have 50 to 70 people showing up. We have an education ministry where we have workshops. We have a trauma workshop starting tonight. That's a six week workshop once a week for six weeks. It's change oriented. People grow and deal with trauma through it. It's part of a, you know, kind of a therapeutic package that can be very helpful to people. Then we have an anxiety and depression relief workshop. We have a training where we actually train people how to do mental health coaching. We have a workshop that helps people know how to deal with abuse, sexual abuse in a church context. I'm gonna be talking about that a little bit today. So we have a lot of educational stuff going on. We're partnering with Southern Adventist University, working on a partnering with them to where people can go through our program and they can get most of the way through a biblical counseling certificate that they can get from Southern. There's just a lot of really great things happening with Abide Network, it's really grown. One of the things I've noticed as I've developed this ministry, and I would say that we have a community model of mental health. We all get to know each other through these various forums, and there's a community that's built, a number of people that have gotten to know each other, and that connection is very strong and powerful. And I would say that the connections between people are the most therapeutic aspect of anything we're doing. We're giving away a lot of good information. We have some great coaching going on, but the friendships that are forming in the context of the larger picture of our ministry are what I think impact people the most powerfully. And I have noticed that there's this thing that I call the Velcro effect. So what I mean by the Velcro effect is 
Velcro sticks, right? That's the whole point of Velcro is you just touch it, you're stuck to something. We all want to cultivate good, healthy relationships in church. That's the lifeblood of the church is the healthy relationships that develop. But the question is how to develop those relationships. Have you ever been in a church context where you didn't even know people and you were already enemies because they didn't believe in the same pre-lapsarian or post-lapsarian view of the humanity of Christ as you? or they took a different stand on the vaccine, or they took a different stand on women's ordination, and one day you said to yourself, wait a minute, I don't even know this person, and they're my enemy. Maybe I should get to know them as a person, and maybe I have something in common with them, and maybe there's some common ground somewhere that even though we're on different sides of this issue, we might find some things that we agree on, and maybe it would be worth cultivating those things. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Okay, so that's one of the things that I've realized, is that if we can we can bond to one another as human beings and as followers of Jesus. That will give us bonds that help us to sort through the differences that will inevitably arise. But if we don't have those bonds, then those differences will turn into polarities. And that's what I think is happening sometimes in the Adventist church is that we don't really connect as human beings and as followers of Jesus in a meaningful way and then we polarize very easily. Because when you love someone and they're different than you, you don't, you're gonna fight for that relationship, right? But if you don't even care about the person and they say something that offends you, you're gonna be like, oh, you know? So we want to create an incentive for people to stay in relationship with each other so that we can sort through our differences in effective ways that lift up Jesus in our midst and his ability to bond us in love, right? You get what I'm saying here? Okay. So that's what I call the Velcro effect. So what I have noticed is, and we're a mental health ministry, so we're all about feelings and emotions and all that. But what I've noticed is if you can create a context in which it is safe for people to talk about what's going on inside of them, it's as if their hearts open up and there's Velcro and they stick to other people. In other words, that ability to talk about our inner lives facilitates bonding in the community. It's powerful. So that's what we do with the Biden Network. We have that Friday night Bible study. We have these different group forums, tons of them really. People run small groups and we have four telephone support groups people can call and we have different um, workshop alumni groups, all kinds of support groups. People go to those groups and it's okay to talk about what's going on inside of you. We do try to create some boundaries because as I mentioned yesterday, there are some people that that's all they talk about and they'll dominate everyone else talking about all their problems and their woes and their depression and their sadness. So you do have to be disciplined about it and create some limits so that it doesn't become an energy drain, if you know what I mean. And we're always working on trying to create those boundaries and that structure to make sure that this sharing, this open-hearted sharing uplifts and bonds people instead of dragging them down. So there's an art to it. But I have found that that ability to connect is very powerful in facilitating emotional and spiritual healing. It's, it's truly, truly tremendous, and I'm grateful to God for showing me that. So by the way, the title of my talk is The Power of Belonging, The Transformative Energy of Knowing We Are Loved and Accepted. Here's what happens, as I mentioned a minute ago, if we don't form these bonds, and we run into inevitable differences. This is just a graphic, you can find this online, of the Democratic parties, the two parties in the United States of America, and how polarized they've gotten over the last couple of decades. So 1994, they're very close. 2004, pulling apart. Look at 2017. And I can only imagine what it is now. Now, there's a lot of theories about why the extreme polarization. We do believe, those of us that observe human nature believe it has something to do with social media. Because it used to be that you turned on the six o'clock news and everybody got the same information, right? Dan Rather or Tom Brokaw or whoever gave you the facts. At least it was pretty much the factual accounts of things that had happened. There was a certain level of pride in good journalism, where you didn't let your political views determine what you shared or what you didn't. You tried to relate the facts. There was a lot of pride in that. Well, now what's happening is 
there are no television channels or media forums that are not colored by their politics. None of them really, very few anyway, especially of the big ones, strive to be objective anymore. And social media does this thing where you're all, your existing preferences did, that are discovered by these uh, algorithms that sort out what political party you lean toward, et cetera, and they've put in your feed things that reinforce those existing views and biases, right? So you get your news from your social media feed, but it's very catered to who you are as an individual and your existing biases, and it's really kind of fake news in that regard because you're never challenged to look at it from a different angle. And so we have that kind of confluence of factors and as a result there's this incredible polarization going on in our world today. This is a little graph of trends in political polarization by country. So there in the dark line you have the United States. Between 1980 and 2010 and beyond you see this spike in polarization, but other countries like Sweden, Germany, uh, Britain, not so much. So we have this incredible amount of polarization in the United States of America in particular, but you know, pretty much globally. So let's talk about how we can combat this in the body of Christ, in the family of God. Do you guys want some tools that will help you sort of be able to create as much inclusion and connection as possible given that we're all different and tools to help us through our differences. Would you like something like that? Would that be helpful to you? Okay, good. So, by the way, I forgot to do the little comment section where you get to give feedback. We'll do that at the end. Don't let me forget. All right, this is Irvin Yalom. He's a very well-known Jewish counselor type guy, behavioral science expert. He's an atheist, he's Jewish, but he is the doyen of group therapy in the field of psychology. And he particularly talks about the power of group therapy to accomplish something that he calls the corrective recapitulation of the primary family experience. So whatever wounds you incur incurred as a result of your family growing up, whatever neglect, maybe your parents neglected you, maybe your father was emotionally abusive, maybe your brother sexually abused you, whatever happened in your family of origin, you can go into this sort of group therapy context and restructure your family and re-experience connection in a way that overwrites the harms of the past. That's called corrective recapitulation. You kind of revisit the same kind of relationship, but you experience it in a more healthy way, in, at least ostensibly and theoretically in this group therapy experience. And it is true that we carry away from our families of origin bonding patterns, our beliefs, and our behaviors. We carry a lot away from that. Our developmental process does really influence who we ultimately become. And so that's the theory, is that in group therapy, you can sort of re-experience family in a way that heals you from the wounds of the past. These are the group therapy stages. It starts with forming the group, then it's called storming because there's a lot of conflict initially, people trying to figure out where they belong in the hierarchy, so to speak, and the power structure. And then there's norming, which involves setting the rules of engagement, how this group is gonna function. And then what they call performing, where the group really starts to do good work and get somewhere, and then adjourning is ending the group. So that's kind of like church in a way. A lot of times we come into a church situation and we go through those same stages. Let's look at what Yalom says about the members of this group and what they experience. He says, members of a cohesive group feel warmth and comfort in the group and a sense of belongingness. They value the group and feel in turn that they are valued, accepted, and supported by other members. People need people for initial and continued survival, for socialization, for the pursuit of satisfaction. No one, not the dying, not the outcast, not the mighty, transcends the need for human contact. Isn't that beautiful? And that was written by a, an atheist who just happens to be very fond 
of group therapy, but you could say the same thing, couldn't you, about the body of Christ. People need people. When I was a new Christian, I would get this. Take it to God. Don't talk to people about your problems. You don't need people. You just need God. I don't believe that anymore. I think we go vertical. And of course, God is ultimately the only one that can help us with some things, but we also need to connect horizontally. We are created for that horizontal connection, human to human, not only connection to God. And we need to cultivate that and learn how to do it well. All right, I wanna look at some research that was conducted by a man named Nathan DeWall from the University of Kentucky. And the research was designed to show how a person's experience of being accepted, feeling accepted, would affect their aggression levels. So in other words, does feeling accepted make you a better person? Does it make you less aggressive? Does feeling not accepted make you more aggressive? That was basically the story that was, or the question that was on the table. So he had, this is a little bit hard to follow, but stay with me here. He had three, three groups of people, actors, participants, and bystanders. Okay, three groups of people in this live experiment. And by the way, this is experimental research, and experimental research can, we always say, correlation does not indicate causality. Just because something exists with something else doesn't mean that that thing caused that something. So that's correlation does not equal causality. But in experimental research, you can establish to some degree causality. And we're gonna see that here. All right, so here are how these three groups interact. The actors, who were literally actors, like Hollywood actors, like people playing a role, acted either accepting or not accepting toward participants. The participants were the ones being studied. They did not know those people were actors. The participants were then given an opportunity with bystanders that were just walking down the road kind of people to cause them to eat a very spicy hot sauce or to shock them with a very loud noise. So those are you know, relatively physically safe ways of being aggressive or not. I remember giving my boyfriend in high school a habanero pepper. He'd never seen one before and I was like, try it. <laughs> it's delicious and he bit into it. It was aggressive on my end. It was not nice. He cried, he had tears flowing down. I remember um, making toast for my friend and putting Breck shampoo on it and saying it was honey and giving it to her and saying, try this. You know, I did things like that. I was a terrible kid. Jesus helped me. But anyway, it's like mild aggression, but not going to kill the person. So that's what they're doing here is giving people an opportunity to do that. And then they measured how aggressive people were depending on how accepted they felt. I'm sorry, I forgot to bring this slide up, but there it is. Okay, so you understand the basic way this is working, right? You wanna go back, okay, there we go. Go ahead and look at that. Yeah. I got pretty much everybody's email last night, but if you didn't, okay, okay. So if there's new people that would like my, um, to be on my mailing list, go ahead and sign. Um, Tracy has, she's holding it up in the air. Okay. Make sure you get that. All right. We good? Let's see how this rolled out. So here's what happened with the hot sauce phase of the experiment, all right? So if the person felt accepted by zero, they had a, quite a high level of aggression, gave a lot of people hot sauce. If they had felt accepted by one person, their aggression level halved. If they felt accepted by two, it went even lower, and three, it went even lower, and you can see where that's going. What about the loud noise phase of the experiment? Same results. If they felt accepted by zero, quite high aggression levels, if they felt accepted by one aggression levels, almost half of the original. Isn't that remarkable? And then it went down from there. So the point is, the more accepted people felt, and the more people they felt accepted by, 
the less aggressive they were. In other words, feeling accepted softens our characters wow. and makes us better people. That's what that research, I think, pretty much proved. And because they can manipulate the variables, they can take a variable away, add it back in, they can then measure the outcome, you can establish some causality there. So I think it's pretty safe to say that the more accepted we feel and the more accepted we can help other people feel, the less aggressive they will be. Wow. <sighs> Even as I'm saying this, I feel convicted that there's some people in my life I need to help them feel accepted and maybe they'll be less aggressive with me. <laughs> I had a personal experience with this. My friend Katie had a bunch of brothers. I think she had seven brothers. She was my best friend growing up. I think she had six or seven brothers, and most of them were older. And based on some observations that I made and reflected back on since then, I believe that there was physical abuse in the home. So it was an aggressive environment, I would say. And these big boys, and you know, just all this muscle in that home and then the dad was a kind of a bully from what I could observe. Well, she had a little brother. His name was Timmy. And Timmy was a handful, as you can imagine, coming out of that environment, constantly bothered my friend Katie and I was the younger brother. You know, the tag along kid brother, you just want to get rid of them and they just keep dogging your steps all day long. The summer days I'd go over to play with Katie. There he'd be all day long bothering us. And we would just try to get rid of him all the time. But for some reason one day, and I don't remember what inspired this, but for some reason we thought, let's try to be really nice to him and see what happens. And we did. And we just like talked to him all day long and played with him and included him and helped him feel loved. At the end of the day, we created a little foil crown and put it on his head and said, Hail King Timmy. And we put our hands in like a hammock like type thing and had him sit on it and carried him. Hail King Timmy. And we just showered him with love and acceptance. And his personality completely transformed. What if we were to harness this kind of thing in the body of Christ and love each other so effectively that we softened as much as possible those rough edges on each other's characters. How many of you would like to see that happen? I mean, I would. All right, so let's look at the biblical content on this issue. There is a word that I really love from scripture. It's called koinonia, and it is often translated communication. So here's some examples, or, or it's often translated fellowship. Okay, so here's some examples. First John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. So it's connection, fellowship, brotherhood, communication, that kind of idea. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship, koinonia, with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So you can see that the oneness we have is in something. It's not just it's not just connecting with other human beings. It's in a closed context, so to speak, or in a structured context, and that is faith in Jesus and faith in the scriptures. And as we enjoy those basic truths of the gospel together, and by the way, when you guys were singing, what, what song, Whiter Than Snow, were you singing that? I mean, I just felt like, let's pack up and go home. Like, the spirit was just on you. As you were singing that simple song about the truths of the gospel, as we fellowship in the gospel together, bonds are created, and there is this wonderful koinonia that takes place, and it is a power for good in the world and in our own lives as well. So this is from my book, 13 Weeks to Joy. I don't usually quote myself, but I do here. We experience, to a greater or less extent, natural love within our birth families, but supernatural love within the family of God. Have you ever said to yourself, I'm closer to my Christian brothers and sisters than I am to my own blood? And I, I've said that and I love my family. But there's a bond there because we walk in the light as he is in the light. And within this supernatural family, each member can experience 
what we call corrective recapitulation or the rewriting of our relational history. In other words, the church is God's therapy group where because of the social acceptance and secure bonds we enjoy, we can all become our best selves. Someone's going to say, yeah, right. <laughs> like, sure. So the reality is there's such a thing as being church burned for the very place where you might have expected acceptance and love. You got the opposite. And believe me, I know what that feels like. I've got my share of poison pen letters from church members that thought that they were being led of God to rebuke me for my sins. And all they were doing was acting under the agency of Satan to tear down the love between brothers, my confidence in them, their confidence in me, and my happiness or their happiness or both. I know what it's like to be hurt by church members because after all, we're all sinners, right? And we're gonna act out that sin at times with each other. But let me say this about being church burned. You're in good company because God is burned too. Read the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Jesus writes letters to the churches, and the last one is his letter to Laodicea. And he says, because you think you are rich and increased with goods, but actually you're poor, wretched, pitiable, blind, and naked. He himself has been wounded by the church, and nobody knows that better than he does. But I want to add one more thing, and that is that I like to say this, and I said it yesterday, I believe, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. No, happy birthday to you. You live in a zoo. But don't get self-righteous. You're one of us too. So we are part of this body. And we are also sinners. We have been hurt by others. But we have also hurt others. Have we not? Yeah. And so we must be honest about that. And here's the example, biblical example I want to give you. Daniel. From what we can see on record, he was a perfect human being. I talked about him yesterday. Deported into Babylon, probably castrated, lived his life out in the courts of Babylon, stood for God in the midst of persecution, faced every fear, didn't flinch, stood though the heavens fell, and was a gracious man to all around him and witnessed of the love of Jesus. What a human being. We have nothing on record of any sin he committed, and yet when he prayed for Israel, recorded in the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter, the longest prayer in the scriptures, he prayed in the office of mediator for Israel, the high priest of Israel in a sense, and he used 32 inclusive pronouns. We have sinned, unto us belongs shame. He talked about himself as if he was part of Israel, even though he exceeded the majority of God's people in character and in conduct and in conscience. He exceeded them, but he still talked about himself as if he was one of them. He's, our, he's a wonderful example for us. He's not our example, but he's a wonderful example for us of humility and how we can say, even though the church has hurt me, I have hurt other people. I am human. Even if I haven't, I have the potential in my nature, which is bent towards sin, to do great harm. And on that point, I am going to count myself as part of Israel. I think all of the polarizations we see in the church really boil down to people separating from the body of Christ because they feel better than. And honestly, it happens on both sides of the conservative liberal spectrum. I'm on social media and particularly on Twitter. There's a lot of progressive Adventists on Twitter. And they're just as self-righteous as the right-wingers that look down at the church because they think the church is Babylon. The progressives look down at the church because the church isn't woke enough. This is just human nature. It's not a feature of the left or a feature of the right. It's a feature of fallen humanity to want to exalt ourselves above even our own brothers and sisters. But God is powerful enough to change that, guys. And we can, by the, through the Holy Spirit and through the repentance I talked about yesterday, we can come together to the foot of the cross and experience healing from our self-exalting ways and learn how to love each other 
and minister to each other as human beings and as fellow believers. Amen? But it can be very difficult to bring this inclusion in because there will be points when we can't include. So I'm going to give you an example of this. I have this ministry called Project Safe Church. And we set up the ministry so that we could educate people about sexual abuse in church. I've experienced it myself. I have experienced it vicariously many times for people I've tried to help. There is such a thing as sexual abuse by clergy or spiritual leadership in the church. Now in the Adventist church, it's not just pastors. It's coaches, it's teachers, it's canvassing leaders. There's so many different kinds of leaders in the Adventist church. But there are individuals who get that spirit in them and they sexually abuse the people that they're leading. This happens in Adventism and the way we handle it is very important. And preventing it is very important. So the ministry here prevents, educates and prevents, but then helps people handle correctly when sexual abuse happens in a church context. And we know that there are times when you can't be inclusive. You have to disfellowship. You have to say, no, you can't come to this congregation because there's someone here you grievously, uh, grievously harmed. And for them to have to see you would be very traumatic. There are times when you have to exclude. And this kind of ministry makes that you know, very, very obvious. Well, the Lord said as much. He said in 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. On that issue of sexual abuse, if we cover up and gloss over significant sexual abuse perpetrated by a spiritual leader, and believe me, it happens. It happens because sometimes, if not often, if not most often, that spiritual leader that takes that kind of liberty is popular, and they're popular for a reason. They preach great sermons, they have a lot of charm, a lot of education, they have a commanding presence, they bring in the crowds, tithe is up, offering is up, the church is booming, and you're gonna bring that pastor down? Sorry, we're gonna believe him and not you because you don't matter as much to us. This happens, it's very sad. But the Lord calls us to stand in spite of that incentive to overlook because what will happen if we gloss over abuse on the part of a religious leader is we will be partaking in that sin and enabling that sin. And so there is a place to draw a line and to create structures and to sometimes discipline or even exclude someone from the congregation. There's a letter that Ellen White wrote about a particular case, and she didn't say this very often, and I don't think she meant this to be applied to everyone that committed sexual sin or engaged in clergy sexual misconduct. But she said in this case, if he's going to be saved, it'll have to be outside of the fellowship of the church. In other words, he shouldn't be a member. And especially today when we have you know, internet church and stuff, it's possible to do that. People can still hear a sermon, they can still be part of the fellowship and not have access to, for instance, children. So we have ways of working around in those extreme cases. Now I'm not saying she applied that to every case, but it's there. And there are times when we need to exclude and have boundaries. So I want to try to distinguish hypocritical separatism from holy separateness, um, because that can be a little bit tricky. In hypocritical separatism, we're of the world. Um, in holy separateness, we're in the world, but not of it. So often in hypocritical separatism, um, we're of the world, but not in it. <laughs> in other words, we've got the world in our hearts. And I could say this of what Laura and I went through at a certain point in our journey in these self-supporting conservative ministries, one of the leaders became extremely lecherous and abusive toward just about every female in the ministry. And he had the world in his heart, but he, was, he wasn't in the world, like he was very separate. He dressed different, he ate different, he checked all the conservative boxes, but he had the world in his heart. 
So hypocritical separatism is of the world, but not in it. Holy separateness is in the world, but not of it. Does that make sense? God wants us to connect with people, but have the kingdom of heaven in our hearts, not have the world in our hearts and disconnect from people. But this is the thing, is when people have the world in their hearts and they have some besetting sin in their lives, often they will compensate for that defeat in their spiritual life by being extra separatist and pulling back as if they're going to be tainted by other people. S human nature is very complex, but that does happen. Okay, so hypocritical separatism focuses on my safety, my salvation, but holy separateness is really about others' salvation. There's an unselfishness to it. Hypocritical separatism avoids people. Holy separateness avoids principles. And let me share with you one of those principles, the principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. So that's pagan religion boiled down for you. You can save yourself by your own works. And I can attest to this. I studied Buddhism. I studied Hinduism. I studied Taoism. All of them had programs where you would generate your own merit through good works. You would save yourself through your good works but Christianity confronted me with an entirely different gospel that said God came to me instead of me climbing up to him. So the principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle wherever it is held. Men have no barrier against sin. Marinate in that for a minute. <laughs> if you believe that what you do or don't do is generating merit, if you believe that you're saving yourself by your works, even on a heart level, and you can believe it without saying you believe it, if your emphasis is all on the law and not so much on Jesus, you may be a legalist and not realize it. But Satan implants that principle, and wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. So moving on from that, I want to talk about how instantly, as we extend this gospel welcome to the world, there will be individuals that one moment seem very hard, that they will never come to faith, and the next moment they will have a faith awakening. Simon of Cyrene, forced to carry the cross of Jesus, he was not necessarily a follower of Jesus or give, gave any indication that he was interested and then he had to be forced to carry that cross but we're told he carried it after that event of his own free will the thief on the cross who thought he would be saved but he was this far and all Jesus had to do is say I tell you today you're going to be with me in paradise and the man was saved we don't know where people are at and we need to keep our hearts open the Roman soldier saying, surely this was the Son of God. When the cross is lifted up, the same thing will happen. All of those events surrounded the cross. When the cross is lifted up, we'll see these faith awakenings that are spoken of in the Bible. Ephesians 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and he has broken down the middle wall of separation, the separation between us and other people, is broken down in Christ. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer to themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Don't look at the outward trappings of people. You don't know how God may be working in their lives. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. And then finally, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We need to bring people to Jesus and declare them a new creature and welcome them into our fellowship. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, you might be one of those people that just have such a hard time seeing this. 
But let me tell you, God wants you to see it. And let me give you a beautiful statement that is found in Fundamentals of Christian Education. We'll close out with this and just one more slide. If we wish to do good to souls, our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief in, our belief in, and appreciation of them. I'm going to read that again. It's a powerful statement. If we wish to do good to souls, our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief in, our belief in, and appreciation of them. That's telling us we can believe in people, not in the same sense that we believe in God, but we can see them as new creatures in Christ. We don't have to regard them according to their past failures. Boy, I'm being convicted, even as I'm reading this, that I need to apply that. Respect shown to the struggling human soul is the sure means through Christ Jesus of the restoration of the self-respect the man has lost. People out of Christ do not have self-respect. They may have self-esteem. They may even have pride. But self-respect is a gift of God. Our advancing ideas of what he may become are a help we ourselves cannot fully appreciate. So many people have that story of that person that believed in them that saw their future even though they didn't look at that time like they had that kind of potential. I think of us, Laura, when we were new Christians, we were crazy. Like we were so unstable and we came out of such weirdness. And I think that there are many people that knew us right there at the beginning of our experience that were like, huh, ah, they're gonna end up in a mental institution or going right back to the world. But the Lord, has stabilized us and strengthened us over time. I want to end with a poem here. What did it cost Jesus to give us this sense of inclusion? What did it cost him? We almost lost him. When our condemnation extinguished his glory, when our vindication required his story, the price of our yes, his no, the price of our joy, his woe, to gain our entrance, extradited, blighted, benighted, all left and all righted, the price of inclusion, exclusion, to buy our admission, extrusion. You know what it cost him. For a moment, we lost him when snuffed out by our metastasis, a cancer that was never his. He nevertheless arched his back and bellowed, where have you gone, my God, my fellow? What did it cost him? Eternity lost him. Scarred forever, flawed and severed, defective, a tumor gouged out, rejected, rejected, the price of our fortune, his loss, the price of our favor, his cross, the price of our embrace, his stabbing pain to buy our belonging, the words go away, the price of our welcome, his eviction, the price of our exoneration, his conviction, the price of our well done, his shunning, the price of our healing, his red blood running, our entrance, his exit, our soundness, his decrepit, that's what it cost him. People, have we lost him? Because all he wants now is, I'll take it. The invitation of the forsaken is that we not waste it. Everything he lost to us in trust at infinite to him, but no cost to us. And I want to ask you a question. Do you want to accept what God has given you, that sense of inclusion? Do you want to accept it and share it with others? It's my question to you. Amen. Raise your hand if you do. All right.